prepare yourself for tales of the creepy, the terrible, and the awful things that hide in the night. Welcome to these dark spaces. Your Death Day Corbin still remembered the day when the first people started to receive their Death Day cards. They were simple white cards, blank on one side, and on the other, the words Your Death Day, with a date underneath it. Of course, everyone thought they were some kind of sick joke until they started coming true. The deaths weren't always anything that would make the papers. Sometimes it was just something as simple as passing away due to natural causes. But the major ones made the papers every time, at least early on. The world was captivated by the cards and like any good sensation, they eagerly consumed everything they could about it. Sometimes the dates people would be given were years away. Those were the lucky ones. But others would get one that was only a few days away. The latter of the two were, naturally, always the ones that freaked out. They received their cards and almost immediately started panicking often going slightly mad from the pressure of knowing they only had a few more days to live. No one ever quite knew where the cards came from or where they were going to show up. Some people found them in their mailboxes one day after work. Others would find them in their pockets when trying to pull out their keys. There was even supposedly a man in Boston that received his card in the folio after the waitress returned it when he paid for his dinner. And that was the other thing. The cards were limited to people in the United States. No cards had been received by anyone else anywhere in the world. This, of course, led to rampant conspiracy theories as to where they came from, and suspecting that the source was somewhere in the United States. Nothing ever came out of any of these investigations, of course. It seemed like every time someone was getting close to figuring out the source, they hit a dead end. After a few years, the cards and their death predictions became commonplace. Someone even set up a website, yourdeathday.com, with forums for people to talk about the cards and, of course, death. They even started to organize by the dates of their deaths, creating long forum posts where the people with the same day would congregate and commiserate with those they shared the day with. And of course, there were plenty of onlookers more than happy to chime in with their own opinions. Corbin was one of these. Being in London, he would of course never received a card but was so morbidly curious about them and the people that had gotten one of those foreboding little white cards that he spent several hours perusing the website and reading the posts in each day's section. His favorite, though, was following along with the mega topic, but why? That had been one of the earliest started on the site. It was a huge thread with at least a hundred new messages added each day, where people were trying to make sense of why the cards started showing up and what they really meant. Early on, some theorized that they were some kind of sick joke, while others thought they were some kind of act of a higher power, trying to humble the human race because we've gotten too proud. The religious zealots had a field day with that last one, of course claiming that the cards were a sign that the end of it all was near and that humans were doomed to be condemned and the cards were their chance to repent. 
so-called card experts also made the rounds on just about every talk show out there, some promoting some terribly written and mostly useless self-help type book that would supposedly help you deal with getting a card and be at peace, or some other such nonsense. Most people saw them for what they were, though, charlatans trying to take advantage of the weak just to make a buck. Corbin had seen enough to be a bit more jaded than that. Hanging out at the local pub, he and his mates, a few pints in, of course, would have tipsy debates about the cards. His one friend believed the higher power theory, while another believed that the cards were actually what caused the deaths, that the person wouldn't have died on that date if they'd never received the card. The day after one of their deep conversations... Corbin was at the gym. His head still swam a bit from a bit of overindulgence from the night before, but he'd managed to still get in a decent workout. Fresh from the shower and wrapped in a towel, he dried his hair with another towel before changing. He quickly dialed the combination to his lock with his free hand and opened the locker with a loud thunk. He reached in to grab his shoes and a clean pair of socks when he noticed the corner of a small white piece of paper sticking out from his left shoe. Assuming it was just some kind of promotional material from the gym trying to sell some new training service, he pulled it out quickly and started towards the trash can in the corner. It was only then that he really looked at what he was holding. A small white card, blank on one side, and when he turned it over, the words, You're a Death Day, printed in neat black letters, with the date 4-5-2024 below it. Frozen to the spot, Corbin's mind tried to comprehend what was happening. Only people in the States get cards, right? He thought, panic rising up inside of him. If this was some kind of joke... It was a damn good fake based on the hundreds of pictures of cards he'd seen online. Maybe one of his friends had decided to play a sick joke on him, knowing how much Corbin was into the Death Day cards and the whole mystery around them. But then, how would they know his locker combination to be able to put the card in his shoe? Corbin stuffed it in the pocket of his shorts, tugged on his shoes, and quickly pulled his shirt over his head. He practically sprinted out of the gym, narrowly missing a man on the way out. Those numbers ran over and over in his mind. Four, five, twenty, twenty-four. Wasn't that far away, just a few short weeks. His stomach was doing backflips as he climbed into his car and hurried home, thankful for the light weekend traffic. He took the stairs two at a time as he raced up to his flat, keys already in hand. Slamming the door behind him, Corbin breathed a sigh of relief. He wasn't exactly sure why, but he felt safer now that he was home. A few deep breaths later, and his heart had calmed back down to normal levels. He took the card from his pocket and inspected it again. The writing was clearly the result of a typewriter of some kind and not printed out from a computer. The cardstock was thick and the edges perfectly cut. It was real. Corbin grabbed his laptop off the table and immediately hit the YourDeathDay.com forums, his hands shaking as he typed, WTF, I got a card. He then shared more about his location, where he'd found the card, and, of course, the day of his death. The board went absolutely wild with responses, everything from people claiming he was a fraud and a liar out to the usual sympathy that he had even received a card. Eventually, even the news media picked up on it, local TV stations and papers hounding him for interviews. It got so bad that he stopped answering his phone, opting to let them fill up his voicemail instead. All of the attention wasn't doing anything to help his ever-growing dread. 
four, five, 2024 was just two weeks away now. Corbin's mind was flooded with morbid thoughts, wondering how he might die. Paranoia began to creep in, and he started looking around his small flat at everything as if it was the enemy that could be the ultimate cause of his death. So he started to clear out some of his belongings, hiding some away in the small closet he had in his bedroom and giving away others to friends and neighbors. With just one week left, Corbin's flat was practically empty, save for some of the larger pieces of furniture that were too difficult to move. He decided that staying inside on that day was his best chance to try and cheat death. Of course, no one, no matter how prepared they'd been, was ever able to have death move on and not take them on their day. But Corbin was resolved to be the first. He'd even built up a sort of bunker from his mattress, some pillows, and the side of his couch where he could hide. He'd already resolved himself to giving up ingesting anything that day for fear it could somehow be tainted. He'd also unplugged every electrical device that remained, removing anything even remotely sharp, and even covered the floor with a plastic sheet, just in case. Finally, the day arrived. Corbin hadn't been able to sleep well all week and was feeling the effects of sleep deprivation, his eyes often heavy and his body feeling weakened and sore. Corbin stared at his watch in the meager light coming from the moon outside, watching it creep closer and closer to midnight. Corbin took in a sharp breath as the final seconds ticked by, waiting for catastrophe to strike as soon as midnight hit. But nothing happened. He let out the breath he'd been holding and listened intently, trying to discern if anything was amiss. Still, nothing. He spent most of the day that way, just waiting and listening. But noon came, and still nothing had happened. His mind was hazy, and he was having trouble holding on to thoughts for very long, but he did start to wonder if maybe it was a hoax, after all. Maybe someone, somewhere, is sitting at their computer, laughing at his messages, knowing they'd made a fool out of him. 5 p.m. came and went, and still, nothing. Corbin's nerves were shot, and every small creak, groan, or bang from around him hidden away in his fort made him jump. Anticipation combined with the sleep deprivation and the growing hunger inside him was driving him mad. 10 p.m. Still nothing. Seconds stretched into minutes. Minutes into hours. It felt like he'd been sitting in the same spot, there on the hard floor, for days. Exhaustion began to overtake him, and his eyes drooped, and his body relaxed. Corbin's breathing deepened as he drifted off to sleep. His body finally pushed to the breaking point and couldn't take it anymore. Corbin's eyes snapped open, and it took a few seconds to adjust to the light streaming in from outside. Morning. It, it was morning. He double-checked his watch to make sure. He'd made it. He cheated death. His day had come and gone, and he was still here. He immediately leapt up and raced to his computer, the one piece of electronics he didn't part with and sat on the floor in the corner. Pulling up the forum, his fingers flew over the keys as he shared the good news. Everyone needed to know about his survival, that it was possible to cheat death. The forum went wild once again, with many asking him to prove it. He looked frantically for something he could use to prove the date on his card and today's date. With nothing around, he raced down the stairs to grab a copy of the Daily Mirror, 
only stumbling once and running completely on adrenaline. He took a picture of himself holding up both the card and the paper, looking a bit worse for the wear, but still smiling. Predictably, a few days later, his phone began to ring with media contacts wanting to know how he'd done it and what was so special about him. He'd even appeared on a local access TV show to tell his story. But as with all sensations, people moved on to the next major story pretty quickly. Within two weeks, they'd stopped calling completely, and Corbin was happy to have his life return to normal. He'd already restored most of his apartment back to its former state, and had even gotten some of the things back from his friends. He tucked the card into his wallet, a reminder of what had happened. He decided that he was going to live his life to the fullest. It had taken Corbin a while to get back to life as usual, with that nagging feeling that death might still come for him always in the back of his mind. But that was dimming with each day that passed. He went back to work each day, enjoyed time with friends, even went on a date with the cute girl from accounting, Sarah, that he'd never managed to work up the courage to ask out. One night, they were out on a date, just leaving a movie, a terrible documentary that someone had made about the cards and how they'd changed society, and they headed to dinner. They talked about their own favorite movies, and she even laughed at some of his terrible jokes. She told him how she was looking forward to trying the restaurant, as she'd heard it was wonderful from some of her friends. They stopped at the corner of a busy intersection, waiting for the sign to change and tell them it was safe to walk across. Corbin was really starting to feel a connection with Sarah, and caught a hint that she might have deeper feelings for him, too. He smiled at her, and she smiled back, and he became lost in his own thoughts. And absentmindedly stepped off the curb. The collision was almost immediate, the car being only about twenty feet away when Corbin stepped in front of it. His body flew forward like a rag doll as the car's tires screamed on the asphalt as the driver slammed on the brakes. Corbin's body lay in the center of the intersection, unmoving, his right arm clearly broken, and a bone jutting out from his leg, a chunk of ragged flesh hanging from the end. Several onlookers were already talking to 999 and trying to get help there as quickly as possible. Sarah ran out into the intersection. Thankfully, all the traffic around it had completely stopped. She reached Corbin's side, sobbing, trying to figure out if there was anything she could do. She reached out, wanting to see if he was okay, but recoiled whenever he coughed and spat blood onto the road next to him. She sat there with him, holding his hand, until the paramedics arrived. But by then, it was too late. As they lifted his body up on the stretcher to move it, Corbin's wallet fell from his back pocket. When she picked it up, Sarah noticed a small piece of paper tucked into the back. One corner stained red from where it had laid in Corbin's blood. It was his card. She pulled it from the wallet. Your death day, she read aloud, holding the card out in front of her, and then gasped when she saw the date, 4-5-2024. It was today, May 4th, 2024. Thank you for listening to These Dark Spaces. We hope you enjoyed this story. You can find out more about us at thesedarkspaces.com or follow us on Twitter at These Dark Spaces. If you've enjoyed listening, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your favorite listening platform. Until we meet again, stay vigilant, keep your senses sharp, and your mind 
open.